Welcome to City Cinematheque, where the art and pleasure of the movies are the subject of serious discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach film studies at the City College of the City University of New York. Today, we're going to visit classic Italian cinema, and it doesn't get much more classic than Rome Open City, directed by Roberto Rossellini. Now, this is one of the films that, for many people, defines Italian neorealism and is a peak of immediate World War II, post-World War II, that is, filmmaking. We'll be talking about that and a number of other things after today's screening. Joining us will be a noted expert on Italian cinema, Professor Jacqueline Reich from Fordham University. Now, take this journey into the end of World War II in Rome, in Rome, open city. Welcome back to City Cinematheque. I hope you've enjoyed this opportunity to see Rome, Open City by Roberto Rossellini. Now, this is one of the major films of Italian film history and indeed a landmark of post-war, immediate post-war European cinema. Uh, for many people, it sets, it sets the template for Italian uh, neorealism, although that's an idea disputed in recent uh, times in a number of, uh, in a number of ways. Uh, there's a lot to talk about about this film, and it's a pleasure to welcome to City Cinematheque uh, Professor Jacqueline Reich from Fordham University. Um, uh, Jackie is the chair there of the Department of Communication and Media Studies. Uh, her uh, lengthy scholarly career has uh, emphasized the uh, Italian cinema as well as the field of star, uh, star studies. Uh, her publications include Beyond the Latin Lover, Marcello Mastriani, uh, Masculinity and Italian Cinema, and Soon to Be Out is her most recent book, uh, which is the Machiste Films of Italian uh, Silent uh, Cinema. Welcome to City Cinema Tech, Jackie. Thank you, Jerry. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. So uh, let's perhaps begin with the, the standard story about the importance of um, Italian neorealism and this film in Italian neorealism. So if you wouldn't mind recounting that, and then you're one of the scholars who's been doing research, historical research, that challenges what perhaps that canonical version uh, was for, for a while. So what's the canonical version? Well, the canonical version is actually based on a lot of myths about neorealism. Um, but one of the things that we can't deny is that Rossellini started filming this film in January of 1945, okay. right after the German occupation. And it was tough filmmaking. Yeah. It was hard to find stock. It was hard to find electricity. So it was, in a certain kind of sense, a new way of filmmaking given the circumstances. So. He goes and he makes this film, and it's like nothing audiences had seen before in the sense it had on-location shooting. Now, that's not to say that there wasn't on-location shooting right. throughout Italian cinema or any cinema, but rather that this was on-location shooting with the idea, with the sensation of creating, the idea to create that you were actually there, right. that you were there while they were filming it. So you had a lot of... Uh, you were shot with a lot of available lighting. There was uh, very kind of shaky cameras. If you remember when uh, in the film they're climbing up the stairs, that's all shot with handheld cameras. Right. Uh, there was a casual mix of professional and non-professional actors. Uh, it was not something that people had seen. Um, most importantly, the subject matter was new right. because it was the first time, really, that they were one of the first times that they were able to film about the war and what was happening in Italy at that time. And that was Rossellini's great concern, is his goal was to film reality as it was happening, right? What was out there, the experience of everyday people. And so I think that was the great novelty of the film. And also, let's take it out of the Italian context. Okay. And it goes to Cannes, it premieres at Cannes, it is an enormous hit at Cannes, and then goes all over the world. So you can imagine American audiences in 1946, when this film comes over, 45, 46, um, who were used to, let's see, what were the dominant films of the era 45, 46? Well, um, you've got The Best Years of Our Lives. Exactly. Uh, which, which has the elegant compositions in depth of, of, of uh, William Wyler uh, and his great cinematographer, Greg 
uh, Greg, Greg Tolan, but there's a sense of, of composition right. to every shot right. there. I mean, it, 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 in, it, it, it's realism, but it's painterly realism of a certain kind, and there's no, certainly no sense of, uh, how, should, how should I put this, with something like um, the best years of our lives. We are invited to inspect everything exactly. that's happening in the frame, which is very different from what you're describing of our sense of being in the frame. Uh -huh. Inspecting something and being in with the action is very, very different. So I think that speaks to two revolutionary um, but rather different concepts of realism in the cinema. That proposed by somebody like Weiler in Best Years of Our Lives and that which is going on uh, in this film. Right. And, you know, we can't also deny that there are some incredibly eloquently composed frames. Oh, true, sure. Most of which rely on uh, Catholic iconography. I mean, Pina dying in, in Don Pietro's arms is the Pietà. Right. right. There's images of the crucifixion. Uh, there's many images of martyrdom, of course, right? right? So there's all kinds of, of, of very sort of, shall we say, choreographed elements of the right. film, but mixed in right. with this kind of, um, how's the best way to put it, mixed in with a kind of almost improvisational kind of filmmaking. Um, so I think that's one of the things, certainly style, a political commitment, right? This was tied to the ideals and the goals of the resistance. Italy had just, or sort of was still immersed or had just come out of um, almost two years of civil war because we have the fall of Mussolini in 43, the armistice is signed, in, is fall, fall of Mussolini is uh, June, the armistice is signed in September, and then there's total chaos, right. because you never know who's, uh, you know, who's <laughs> on what person's side, and which is actually the subject of a great movie with Alberto Sordi called Tutti a Casa, which is a wonderful film that sort of tells that, that kind of, that, that confusion from that sort of right. angle, from a comic angle. But, to return to Rome Open City, um, so you had this period of intense fighting, and you can see the tension right. in Rome Open City between the collaborators and the resistance fighters. Right. So the collaborators would be certainly the local commissary, um, or mayor, I think he's called, the commissario, um, the translator, right, right? Um, the, the fascist soldiers who have turned policemen. And that was a very sore subject for Italians and something that they still have trouble um, reckoning with today. So those are all the elements. At the same time, the film is a hybrid of multiple genres, right? Genres that can be traced all the way back to the silent period and also flourish during the fascist period. One of the other reasons why people like to see this film is yeah. so, so, is so much of a rupture was because they wanted, or sort of film scholars, Italians, intellectuals, wanted to really make a break with the fascist period. Right. And this film kind of can, can, can sort of provided them with a very convenient way to make that break because it was so different. But we have to remember that where did Rossellini get his start? Rossellini got his start working during the fascist period. He worked on a series of films with Vittorio Mussolini, um, Benito Mussolini's son. Uh, he Who was in charge of the Italian film industry. Uh, partially, yes. Partly. Yes, he was the editor of Cinema. He wasn't the complete head. Yeah. It was a little bit more complicated than that. Um, Usually is. <laughs> <laughs> and, he ha um, and so he had many, many ties. Now, he would always say he was a fascist, but he certainly could not have worked in the industry on the films that he did um, had he not been an anti, had he been an anti-fascist. Right. Uh, so there's, there's that sort of tie. Then there's the wonderful presence of Anna Magnani and Aldo Fabrizi, who were also pretty big stars um, of stage more than screen. Okay. But they had made some films together before Open City, one of the most famous being Campo dei Fiori, which is the market, the famous market in Rome. And these were comic films. So here they are placed in this movie against type, right? Rossellini does some very interesting casting here. Um, and you could see sort of moments of comedy, probably during some of the most tension-filled moments of the right. film. So, for instance, when Don, uh, Don Pietro has to go and uh, hit 
the sick man with the frying pan right. to get him to play dead. Or when Pina is being held back as Francesco is being dragged off, right, she smacks him. She smacks the guard and right. kicks. And it's kind of funny, right? So there, there are those um, kind of elements that still have deep roots in Italian comedy, which from the Neapolitan tradition, from local traditions, from national traditions, is very, very strong. Well, I have to point out another one of those, one of those examples, which is when Don Pietro is, is standing uh, between the two statuettes. Oh, right. And, and a very famous, you know, you know, moment of visual comedy in which we're following him, following the eye line of one statue to the other, mm -hmm. and of course, it's all part of a of a, tra of a tradition of portraying a comic priest and his you know his his moral presence. And for those who have watched this show for a number of years, they will notice that that particular moment is in the opening montage of City Cinema. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just you know, you got to work because that that shows the admiration that we have for mm -hmm. uh, uh, for this film. But let's uh, l let's let's return, you know, uh, again to this notion of the hybridity mm -hmm. of this uh, of this film because one of the to, to go back to the canonical version, there's a way in which in its sim there's a simplified canonical version that turns neorealism into into something pure, mm -hmm. and, and like and like all genres, it's a quest for the purity of, of of the genre. But it strikes me that one of the things that you're asserting, with a gosh darn lot of evidence, there, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 Jackie, is, is, is that its very nature is its hybridity of cultural and artistic uh, artistic materials. You say it much better than I do. <laughs> I'm not so sure about that, but thanks, <laughs> but thanks, but thanks for the compliment. <laughs> no, absolutely. Just to go back, just to give you an example, going back to that scene, okay. right, with in, in the store with the two statues, right? right? The, the sort of mythology behind that scene, although I have not seen actual proof of it, um, is that Fellini, who was, who collaborated on the script here, right. wrote that scene. Okay, what I've heard in a couple of interviews being said was that Rossellini sort of let Fabrizi do that, you know, let him okay. have that kind of improv, and he was going to take it out, but Fellini said, no, no, keep it in. It's great. So there's a perfect element, whereas a Fellini, a lot of people like to think of early Fellini as neorealist and sort of La Strada as being this kind of film that breaks with neorealism. But I would sort of assert that Fellini always brought a sort of sense of humor uh -huh. to films um, that he collaborated, collaborated on, like Open City, and I believe Paisa as well, that was you know, unique. Um, but to return to some of the canonical issues in the film, I mean, most of it is related to style and po politics right. and ideology, because much film criticism in Italy was ideological. Okay. And you had certainly the left. I mean, you see them printing and reading Lunita, right, right. in the film. Lunita is the Communist Party newspaper. Right. And uh, that was, and, and you have also in Unita not only news, but cultural wars raging about right. what is the right way to represent fascism? What is the right way to represent the war? Um, and they needed a new style, a new language that was not necessarily limited to cinema. Right. You have art, you have literature, you could think of um, Italo Calvino's The Path to the Spider's Nest. Um, there are many, many novels written around this time that are of a very neorealist bent, that deal with the war, deal with the resistance. So this is, this is actually, in a certain sense, a larger national aesthetic yes. debate uh, that in a certain sense in the film course gets de gets reduced to, be, to a debate about film, but it's actually a much larger debate that's going on within the society that touches, and the intellectuals see it as, as we would use the word now, transmedial. This, right. is, this, is, this is about something that crosses genres, crosses media of representation, mm -hmm. that goes to the, uh, you know, to the heart of what we are as a culture at this historical moment. Exactly. It was very indicative, and I think you have to take a wide view. Exactly. It's very dangerous to look in one film in isolation. And when we, you and I are guilty of this in some ways when we teach our film history sure, courses, sure. we have one week to cover neorealism, right? right? How do you do it? Or you have one week to cover Italian cinema. What film do you show? You know, what's the most representative of it? And oftentimes we fall back on neorealism, which in the larger scheme of things I think is a very valid 
uh, point because it was so different. And the point of it, though, is that it is new realism, neorealism. Right. And that those realistic tendencies existed in Italian cinema way before. And now we often speak of a kind of neo-neo-realism, or I think we're now we're up to neo-neo-neo-realism, <laughs> yeah, no. right? Uh, where we are often falling back on and comparing uh, new Italian cinema, recent Italian cinema to the past. For instance, there's been an obsession, or uh, not obsession, that's not the right word. There's been a, a deep interest. A deep interest. <laughs> Some might say obsession. With historical, with, with, with the telling of stories based on history, right. recent history, um, terrorism in particular, right. um, crime, uh, uh, kidnappings like the Moro kidnapping, right, that have appeared over and over again in films, uh, bombings, recent right. bombings from the 70s, the years of lead. And those, are, I think, are very interesting and they're very influenced by, um, by Italian neorealism. At the same time, you have a film, right, we could talk about La Grande Bellezza right. that won the Oscar. Great beauty, yeah. But which is very not real neorealist. Right. If it's anything, it's a it's a homage to La Dolce Vita. Yes, it's a ne it's neo Fellini. It's neo Fellini, Fellini. exactly, exactly. Uh, well, um, I, I just want to add one thing to that, uh, which which is that uh, as if not a genre uh, neorealism, but as an aesthetic debate, mm -hmm. you know, with with lots of positions, it's one of the great migratory debates of film history yes. in the sense that. Um, a lot of Latin American uh, film of the 60s and yeah. 70s was deeply influenced. The Latin American filmmakers went and studied in Italy with the masters of, um, of, uh, of neorealism, um, you know, debates about African cinema, all, many of the cinemas that have come from the developing world or the post-socialist world. Mm -hmm. um, th this, it, when, you, when you read the interviews with the filmmakers, uh, there are ways in which they are responding. They say, well, wait a minute. What these, what these people did in Italy 60, 70 years ago is something that fits right. what the, the historical circumstances we are on. We're, you know, history repeats itself. We're in that kind of situation. What's our way of telling a story? And it's not simple imitation ever. It's, it's this notion of, well, let's adapt in some way. Uh, I would m mention the, uh, you know, a great French-Vietnamese film, Cyclo, which is a kind of homage to the bicycle right. thief, uh, but adapts it to the Ho Chi Minh City of the, 19, mm -hmm. uh, of the 1990s. So uh, neo Italian neorealism, and this is one of the key texts of it, has provided a voca an aesthetic vocabulary and an aesthetic debate that is ongoing, I think, in, in global cinema, not the least of which is American independent cinema. Absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, it, its reach really is global. And, and it continues to have it because I think almost more than its visual impact is neorealism's emotional impact. Okay, let's and, talk about that. And they, they really didn't deny it. Let's take a, a perfect example, right? Um, you're sort of assuming that uh, Pina is our protagonist, mm -hmm. right? Uh, although it's, it's, it's easy to make an argument that there is a group protagonist, right? Yeah. right? But for the most part, you know, you have Anna Magnani, you have Don Pietro, right? They're the big stars. Um, you have uh, Fabrizi, right? They're the big stars. What happens? Exactly halfway through the film, she's gunned down and murdered in a most brutal fashion. Absolutely. Right? That, in and of itself, is an enormous emotional impact, especially for audience, audiences who were accustomed to seeing their protagonists succeed, right? right Based, whether we like it or not, we're dealing with the Hollywood model. And something that Alfred Hitchcock would do in Psycho, absolutely, right, 15 yeah. years later, right? Where you take your protagonist, sorry if this is a spoiler alert, uh, you take your protagonist. Uh, it's kind of well known that Janet Lee does not make it to the end of Psycho. I think, I think that's, uh, that's one of the plot spoilers that's gone on for, for quite a while, yeah. But she dies, and you're sort of left Wait a minute. You know what? Where happens? are they going from here? Right. What happens now? And the film does take a decidedly more serious turn. Gone are the this now being Rome Open City. Gone are the elements of humor, right? right? Um, and you have moments of tenderness. Uh, you have moments of pathos. You have the lovely scene between Francesco and Pina's son, right? right absolutely. You have the scene where Don Pietro. Uh, Manfredi dies, and Don Pietro curses right. the Nazis. 
and then he realizes what he has done. So there are moments where this kind of emotional impact, I think, is very strong. Um, and that comes in many ways from Rossellini's Christian humanism. Okay, let's talk about that and its relationship to, to the politics of the, uh, of the film, because there's a wide range of participants either that we see or are, or are referenced. I mean, we know, you've already talked about the cluster of bad guys on the wrong right. side, the wrong side of the fence, but we have uh, a communist uh, protagonist, we have a priest mm -hmm. protagonist, we have someone who's not particularly political like Pina, but who's, a, who's the average citizen sur sur survivor, and we have the reference, we even have the references to the monarchists who are against the fascists mm -hmm. uh, and, and how they're part and part of the resistance. So what are we to make of this mix in the film and is there a kind of hierarchy of priorities that Rossellini has? I think that Rossellini's greatest priority was humanity. You know, I think that he was astounded by the cruelty of the fascists, the cruelty of the Nazis, and he wanted to show that and he wanted to show its effect on Ev on the ev and I'm going to say this in a very politically incorrect way, but this is really what the neorealists were about. He wanted to show its effect on the common man, mm -hmm. right? Cesare Zavattini, who was Vittorio De Sica's collaborator, right. really focused on the notion of the everyday and the portray that film should portray the life of the everyday man. That was his concept of pedinamento. For Rossellini, his was all about a humanity. And this is a question I think that comes back and back throughout the film. How could people do this to each mm. other, right? Do you remember the scene when he and, when Don Pietro and Pina are talking and they're saying, you know, where is Christ? You right, know, yes, indeed. Right, where is Christ in all of this? And these are questions that in Catholic Italy, right, you would not necessarily pose. So although Rossellini has been accused, I think sometimes, and I think unfairly, of being too Catholic in this film, he is someone for whom Catholicism and Christianity is a means to understanding human nature and understanding humanity and what that means. Okay, uh, and, so, and so what about the, uh, how did the communist presence get in, in there? Because there's a whole mythology of, uh, you know, of the, of, of the role of the Communist Party, which was significant, but, you know, uh, in, in the resistance, and what's uh, Rossellini's relationship to that? Well, um, again, Rossellini was, and this is really not my area of expertise, so I'm going to defer to other people about the ideological portion of it, but that this film was, I mean, it was very communist, but in as much as the resistance was itself yeah, yeah, communist. Yeah. That the resistance was communist because it was also anti-fascist. Right. It was communist because it believed that people should rule, not one dictator. And that's where the movement comes. And that notion of the, I think the notion of the group protagonist in this film, I think the idea of anti-fascism being tied to communism, but there are many, many other films um, right. where communist ideology is much more in the foreground. Um, I could think, for example, of a film like Bitter Rice, right, where the Raffalone character is basically spouting communist ideology. Here it's much more subdued, I think. Right, and, and this comes back to what you were talking about uh, uh, earlier, uh, that his notion of the ideology of the moment, while it might be, may be dominantly humanist, is also hybrid. Yes. Uh, so he's not going for a, a notion of any singular pure ideology because these things all coexist and coexisted on the anti-fascist uh, side. Yes. His larger organizing principle is, 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 is is humanist, but it's a humanist that's inclusive mm -hmm. um, in, in, in that way. Except for the fascists. Well, no, well, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> inclusive of, of all parties who are anti-fascist. Uh, anti, anti Correct. We don't really have very much time left, but what about the portrayal of the sexuality of the fascists? Where does that come from? Well, you know, that is, I think, the beginning of a very long trope that exists throughout Italian cinema, um, and, and not only Italian cinema, but also other national cinemas that deal with this period, is the vilification 
of the Nazi um, as sexually, and I'm going to say perverse, right? Right. Um, as That's deviant, what the trope says. Right, as deviant socially, as deviant sexually and socially. So we have um, the actor Harry Feist, who was a dancer, right? Right, playing, um, playing the German, the right. Nazi, and the woman, Ingrid, who is a lesbian, clearly. Right. And these were notions of vilification, right? right? This comes back again and again. I mean, you could watch The Conformist, you could watch uh, 1900, uh, the, the Night Porter, right. right? We have many of them. Okay. Well, so we're going to um, end our discussion here because we've, we've, we've run out of time. But I think we brought up a number of points that I hope our viewers will uh, continue thinking and um, and talking about. Um, if you've today, if you've enjoyed today's uh, screening, please come back to City Cinema Tech or find out more about what we're doing here. How would you do that? Visiting our website, www.cuny.tv. There you'll find a listing of the films in coming weeks. You'll find what you'll find also information about the other programming at CUNY TV. And you'll find ways to communicate with us if you want to give us your commentary or sign up for an e-list in which we'll give you notifications about coming films. So please visit www.cuny.tv. Jackie, thank you for a whirlwind 30 minutes <laughs> <laughs> of Rossellini and Rome Obensee. There's still a lot to talk about, uh, about this film, but also about Italian cinema and star studies. And I hope you'll be, come back someday and do that with us. I'd love to. Thank you so much. This has been great. Great. Super. And I hope that you join us again, as in coming weeks, we're going to be looking at more classic Italian cinema, but as always, as we stroll through the archives of film history. Thanks for joining us today. And for now, it's goodbye.